Hey everyone, I'm Carlos, I'm the founder and CEO of Product School. And today I'm here with April Danforth, who is the author of Obviously Awesome. Hey April. Hey, it's good to be here. How are you? I'm so excited to have you after seeing you in other interviews. Can't wait to talk about positioning. You know, we've done over a hundred interviews on the podcast. We've never touched on this topic. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> How do you position yourself? What's the story behind the book? Um, well, you know what? I got interested in positioning in my my very first job, at, like right after university, I got a job at a startup. And I got assigned, I was a product marketer, and I got assigned to a product that was failing. And in the end, we, we considered end of lifing the product but in the end we repositioned it and this thing that was failing took off and it it was wildly successful we ended up getting acquired by a, a big big company um i took over the marketing department for this group in a big company and we repositioned a couple other things that that, that unlocked a bunch of growth there too so early in my career i i got my eyes opened to the power of really good positioning to take something that doesn't look very extraordinary and make it extraordinary. So I thought, hmm, this is a really important thing. Um, and then I spent a lot of time after that in my career trying to figure out how to optimize the process for actually doing it, because it seemed like a thing that I was going to have to do over and over again. And so um, for 25 years, I was kind of a repeat vice president of marketing at a series of successful startups. I think I did seven, six of those got acquired. Four or five years ago, I made the switch to consulting, and now I just do positioning work, and I just work at tech companies, and here we are. Now I'm on your podcast. Well, I'm, I'm honored to have you here because in the product management world, it's not clear who owns positioning. You mentioned you've been as a product marketer and a marketing leader at multiple organizations. So in your experience, at least typically, who was in charge of positioning? Yeah, so I, I was, we were talking before we started, and I get this question so much, particularly from product managers. And if I do a talk at a product management conference, first question, like if I say, if there's any question, there's a hand up and someone says, who owns it? We need to know who's the owner, who's going to own this thing? Um, and I think a lot of bad positioning comes from individual teams trying to own it, which is, so I think that's a mistake. Um, so typically when we think about ownership, it's generally marketing or product. The reason that is, is because marketing and product generally feel the pain of weak positioning before other teams do. So, so in marketing, you'll notice that your campaigns aren't working so good. You'll notice that your marketing doesn't really hit the way you think it's going to hit. Sales will feel it in that people don't really understand what you are. The pitches are landing kind of flat. On the product side, there'll be all this angst over what are we building and who's it for And we because we don't have clarity on the positioning. But here's the deal. Positioning actually forms the underpinning of everything we do in marketing and sales, everything. Like I can't do a campaign until I understand who is the campaign for and I got to build messaging. So what's our value proposition? So how are we differentiated from our competitors? Who are our competitors? Uh, same thing with everything we do in sales. Like who are we going to target here? All of these things are defined by positioning. Uh, on the product side, it really has an impact on our product roadmap. What is it we want to be? Where are we going? What are the customers we're trying to get? So here's the thing. It, it, because it underpins so much of the company, we can't actually perform at our best if we aren't all in alignment on positioning. So that means if we really want to do an adjustment on positioning or tighten up the positioning, this is actually going to be a team sport. So we actually marketing and product and sales. And if you have customer success, we need that. If you have professional services, we need that. And importantly, I need the CEO and the executive team all in alignment on this because we can't all be telling different stories out in the market. So if we really want to execute on positioning in terms of getting the job done, and figuring out what the positioning should be, that is actually a job for the executive team. Now, once we've figured out what the positioning should be, 
then you know you might ask the question well who's the steward of positioning like so who's responsible for making sure that we are actually executing on that position and in my opinion that is product marketing's role so if you have product marketer product marketing as a function in your company then it's product marketing that should own that otherwise i think it's a toss up it's either it's whoever's doing the product marketing function which is either marketing or product you know what's interesting like i remember when I started my, my current company, Product School, as a founder, I still know a lot about the competitive landscape and about my own product, and I have access to users. But as the business grew, realized that it was in my head. And if, like, what yeah. I understood by positioning or like how I position my product was different from what maybe what my marketing leader or my sales leader would understand. So yeah. in those type of situations, what would be some good practices for you know, all of those teams to align and really have a clear definition, no matter who's asked that question? Yeah. So there's a few things that I think are really important. So, you know, the first one is I got to get the teams all in alignment. If we want really good positioning, we got to have marketing, sales, product, the executive team. Everybody's got to be in agreement and alignment on around positioning. So we need to get the gang together. We need to work on it together. But here's the thing. If I get the group together and say, okay, we want to define who's our competitor, how are we different, what's our differentiated value, who's our best fit customer, what market do we intend to win, these are the components that make up positioning, so we want to do that. I need to do this in a structured way, because if I don't have a methodology to do this, then what will happen is we'll get the gang together and people will say, well, okay, so um, why does everyone love our product? And this is, a, this is gonna be a bad conversation because what will happen is everybody will have an opinion about that. And that's all it is, is an opinion. And the CEO will say, well, I think people love our product because of this. And sales will say, well, that's not what I think. I sell this every day and I think they love it because of this. And product will say, no, no, they love this. And marketing will say, no, no, they love this. And so there'll be a lot of opinions. And usually what happens if it's a battle of opinions, the CEO wins, sometimes sales wins. Marketing never wins. Product never wins the battle of opinions. So if we're going to have that conversation, we need to have a methodology to do it. Um, which has been a lot of what my focus has been on is how do I actually build a methodology so if I get this group together, can we walk through and build the positioning in a structured way that takes the that takes as much as we can the opinions out of it um, so that we can build on reality. Now, an important piece of this methodology is kind of the starting point. So in, in the work that I do, the starting point is um, being able to answer the question, who do we got to beat in order to win a deal? Now, for a lot of people, that's, that's like, who's our competition? But if you think about it, um, our, our, you know, the word competition can mean a lot of different things. Like if I'm talking to product managers uh, and I say, who's your competition? Generally, a good product manager comes to me and they got a list and there's like, 80 companies on this list, right? There's like, and they'll be like, here's my competitive document. And here's all the companies I'm tracking. There's 80 of them. Oh my gosh. And th this is who we compete with. But if you walked over to sales and said, who do we compete with? Sales will say, mm, Oracle. That's it. <laughs> Just Oracle. <laughs> and they're thinking about who do I see in deals? Who do I lose deals to? Um, the reality is, for positioning work, we need to be able to position the product to beat whatever the customer would do if you didn't exist. And so that consists of kind of two types of competitors. The first competitor is do nothing. So the, the first competitor is what's status quo in the account? And if you're B2B software, status quo in the account is often, I'll do it with a spreadsheet or I'll hire an intern, or we'll just do manual processes. And if we look at the data on this, in B2B, 40% of purchase processes ends in no decision, which means you lost to the intern, you lost to the spreadsheet, you lost the manual process. So we need to understand that because we need to position our product in such a way that we win against Excel, we win against Joey the intern, 
But we also have to win against the company decides they're going to go into a purchase process. If it's business to business, they don't just look at your product. They'll make a short list of products and you got to beat everybody else that's on the short list too. Now, typically, if I talk to sales, they won't be thinking about status quo as a competitor, so they don't count that. If I talk to product, they're tracking every single potential competitor that we that might come out of the woodwork in the next 10 years because they're thinking about product roadmap, and that's fine for product roadmap. But in positioning, I do not have to worry in marketing and sales about positioning against phantom competitors. I only have to worry about positioning against what is actually a competitor in the minds of customers today. If some other new competitor pops out of the woodwork 10 years from now, no problem. We'll adjust the positioning then. It's not like we're going to carve positioning in stone and never look at it again. But the positioning, the best positioning I can do right now clearly positions your product against the alternatives, which is status quo and anybody who commonly lands on uh a short list against you, and that's it. <laughs> so we don't have to position against all 90 competitors. It's usually a quite a short list, actually, when we get down to it. Love that. Um, because I think there's also this misconception around just shipping features for the sake of it and beating the competitor, while sometimes yeah. it's, just, it's, it's just different. Yeah. Um, so let's say we get alignment between product, marketing, sales, CEO, we all follow a methodology and you know, feel good about it. Then what? How do you go from paper to reality? Yeah, so there's a handful of things. Um, when I started doing positioning work, um, you know, marketers, if marketers are doing positioning work, the first thing they want to do after we get all in agreement, like, so we'll get the gang together. We'll all agree on, okay, here's who we compete with. Here's how we're different. This is our differentiated value. These are the customers that are really good fit for our stuff. This is the market we intend to win. Okay, good. We've got the positioning. Let's go. And what marketers want to do is they want to do messaging next right so okay great so let's change the headline on the web page and let's redo all the copy and let's go nuts on on messaging um i actually think there's a good step to do before that which is we kind of want to validate the positioning first now most people will think that we'll validate the positioning with messaging right like we'll, we'll you know maybe we'll a b test the headlines or the home page or whatever and that's actually a test of messaging and you know and a lot of other things a test of web page design and a bunch of other things but it's not actually a pure test of positioning like you don't know if the positioning was bad or you just did a bad job of writing copy around it so i actually think if you're selling b2b and you have a sales team the best thing to do with positioning once you have it is to take that positioning and craft a, a sales pitch deck out of it. So I call this a sales narrative. So we'll craft a sales narrative and then we'll build a pitch from that, which is usually a deck, a demo, a script, and then sales and marketing together, or in this case, product marketing, if you have it, together, take that pitch and go test it out on some customers and see how it does. And so um, what you're looking for is, does it work better than the old pitch? So are there places where people are getting really excited? Are there places where people are getting confused? Um, typically in the work I do with companies that I work with, we'll do the positioning, we'll craft a sales narrative, sales and marketing will work together on a sales narrative. They'll train someone on the sales team to deliver it and marketing and sales will then go and do a bunch of these pitches and they'll be tuning the narrative as they go along, depending on how the competitor, how the uh, prospects react to it. Once you've done a handful of those, and you know my pass fail criteria on this is, if we do a bunch of pitches and we tune it a little bit, then we'll get to a point at some point where the salesperson will say, you know what, this is good. I like this better than the old one. I'm not going back to the old pitch and you can stop sitting in on all my calls, April, uh, we're good. At that point, I would consider that a pass. Um, I would then take that sales rep, let them train the rest of the sales team on the pitch, and then we're ready to go start working on messaging. I think we actually need to validate with customers first before we get into copy, um, because we might learn something in those pitches with actual live customers about, you know, particular terminology or particulars in the way we tell the story. So we want to validate it with customers first, then we go to messaging. And I know there are multiple tools out there that 
enable that at scale and can literally identify what are some of the things that resonate as part of sales speech and um, eventually, you know, just get those good practices across the board because in right. large organizations with multiple sales reps at a time, I can imagine someone saying, you know what, that's great, April, but you know, I, I know how to sell. I tell my story. I take my notes on the spreadsheet. Oh, yeah. Here's the thing. No, salespeople hate a new pitch. They just hate it. It doesn't matter. Your pitch could be like golden. It could be perfect, but it is not the old pitch. And everybody's used to the old pitch. So when you come with a new pitch, nobody wants your new pitch ever. <laughs> so usually what I would do, if I come with the new pitch, the first thing I would do is I'm not going to try to roll it out to everybody all at once, but forget it, right? Because there would be a mutiny in sales. They would just say, no, get lost. We're not, you know, we're comfortable with the old one. So usually what I would do is I would pick one, I would pick my best sales rep. Sometimes it'd actually be the VP sales. If the VP sales does a lot of sales calls, I do it with the VP sales. But if the VP sales is more of a manager and not an actual salesperson, then I would take the best rep and I train them. So we'd spend a bunch of hours. Here's how you pitch it. This is the way you do it. This is the way this demo is going to work. So we'd train for a while, right? We'd hang out before we go unleash it on customers. And then we do this iterative thing on customers, like pitch it, and then me and the rep would go back, okay, what worked and what didn't work? Okay, let's let's pitch this. Because a rep knows, like especially if you've got a good rep, they know what's working and what's not in a pitch while they're in it. So if you catch them right after and say, okay, what worked and what didn't, let's tune it, let's tune it, let's tune it. And my whole goal is to get to a point where the best rep I've got says, this is a better pitch than the old one. Because that's a moment. <laughs> and then if I can convince the best rep on the, teal that, on the team that this is a better pitch than the old one, then I make that rep go sell the rest of the team. I don't do it. You do it. <laughs> like your job is to get all these people <laughs> to use this new pitch. And generally that's better because the sales team will believe the best rep more than they're going to believe me. Right? The best rep's going to come and say, look, I've done seven pitches. This works way better than the old one. You guys got to try this out. And then we'll train the team and stuff. But yeah, it, it, nobody likes the new pitch. Everyone hates the new pitch. You got to work your way into it. So how can product empower and, and help uh, marketing and sales teams position the product better? Because I assume that, okay, we tested this. It seems like it has legs. We have a sales champion who's convincing the sales the sales right. reps to use the pitch. And now we're ready for prime time. We need to do this at the scale. Well, so there's a bunch of things where it's super important for products. So first of all, when I'm saying marketing in this, a lot of the times it's product marketing. If you're big enough to have product marketing function, this is, in my opinion, the cornerstone of what a good product manager is doing. Good product manager is working with the sales team, making the sales team, making sure the sales team positions stuff correctly, making sure that everybody understands. Now, on the product side, it, we typically think about a shift in positioning. Um, the immediate impact is there's an impact in marketing and sales. There's an impact in the pitch, and there's an impact in the way we talk about the product, so messaging. This is the immediate impact. The later impact comes from how does this actually impact the way we prioritize features and what we're actually going to build. So if you think about it, like, um, I'll give you an example. I worked at a company where um, we sold a thing and we thought it was a database, like it was a database. The founders were database guys. They built this sci-fi database. And there was a bunch of patents and it could do a certain kind of analytic query really, really fast. So that was their whole thing. Super high performance on analytic queries. And at some point we repositioned it to um, uh, a data warehouse for machine generated data, that's what we were. And so in that shift, now you can think about it, at the beginning, it just changed our pitch. The product was the same, but it changed the way we contextualized it. But if you went back to, then we went back to product, it's like, well, hang on. If we're not a database anymore, and what we are is a data warehouse for machine generated data, like our old product roadmap was all about making us a better database. Like what are the features we need to get to, to be, you know, feature parity with things like Oracle and the other big databases out there. Whereas if you look at um, a data warehouse, 
there's a bunch of other things that matter there. So in the data warehouse, like what were we like? We didn't even have reporting, <laughs> which is kind of a key data warehouse thing. So the first thing the product team did was they're like, look, we're going to have to fill this reporting gap in the short term, which we did through some API stuff and some strategic partnerships with reporting vendors. And then we started working on some in-house dashboarding and reporting so that we had some capability internally. So this shift in the way you think about the product um, is absolutely going to have an impact on your product roadmap. And that's where I think product management needs to really understand the positioning and understand the longer term impacts of, okay, so if this is the market we intend to win, what does our product need to look like in order to stay ahead of that market next year and the year after and the year after? And how do we work with development to make sure we're building the right stuff to really deliver on this positioning, not just today, but the next release and the one after? You know, in tech, at least in Silicon Valley, I've, I've heard so many founders saying, well, we are the Amazon for X or the Uber, or if Uber and Pinterest had a child, yeah. we would be, and, and they, in their mind, it's super clear, right? But in reality, yeah. like, what is going on? What, what's your yeah. take on these type of definitions when the product is, is complicated or too technical yeah. using a, a, a more mainstream product? All right, so here, here's, here's where this stuff comes from. This whole Uber, we're Uber for whatever, or we're, you know, Facebook for whatever, Airbnb for whatever, this, the only place where this is even remotely interesting is in a VC pitch. So if I'm pitching to raise money, it makes a lot of sense for me to compare myself to some high growth unicorn thing, whatever. Um, because your pitch, your positioning for an investor is really, really different than your positioning for a customer. So your positioning for an investor is all about, look, you know, Great changes are at work here and the world is changing and there's going to be winners and losers because the market is turning itself upside down. There's going to be fire and explosions. And after the smoke clears, we're winning and everybody else is losing. <laughs> That's what we're going to be. And this actually works pretty good in an investor pitch because you're pitching the vision, you're pitching the future. Uh, typically, the product that you have right now is not the reason people are investing in you. They're investing in you for the thing that you're going to be able to do in five years, 10 years. Whereas our pitch for customers is not that at all. So our pitch for customers, yeah, we might talk a little bit about the vision, but in general, the customer is giving you their cold hard cash right now for the thing you can do right now. You have to prove that there is value today. Because if all you got is value a year from now, well, maybe I'll just wait, I'll buy your stuff a year from now. When you got that cool stuff, call me back and I'll buy it a year from now. So if I need to have urgency in sales right now, I need to pitch this in a way that, that is clear for the customer, here's the value you get right now. Now, here's the problem. When you say to a customer, a not tech person, but imagine maybe even a person who doesn't live in Silicon Valley, and you say, you know, I'm Uber for cats. What does it mean? Does it mean the cats drive the car? Does it mean, you know, like, and, and do, do people think the thing, because if you say you're Uber for cats to a VC, I think a VC might think about, you know, you know, the way the business model of Uber. But if you just talk to a person, a buyer that isn't in this VC bubble and say you're Uber for cats, it's gonna be, what does this have to do with cars? What, is, what does this have to do with taxis? Nothing. <laughs> and so it comes with all of this baggage. So you might you might think Uber means XYZ, but you're Buyers might say, well, Uber means, you know, Uber means nobody makes any money. Uber means whatever. Like there's a bunch of baggage that comes with that. So I think you're better to be clear. And, and if you're going to position yourself, you need to position yourself in a market, which means I need to position myself so that the customer understands a comparable that is very much like me. So what are you? Are you CRM? Are you a database? Are you chat? Are you email? What are you? Uber is not a market. Uber is a company. 
And it's, you know, and lots of people have lots of different associations with that. And unless you happen to be in the ride share market, why would you compare yourself to that? You're just going to confuse people. You're going to say, what? You're in the, you're in the ride hailing market. What are you talking about? So I, I, I really hate this Uber for whatever comparison. I don't know why people do it. And I think it's bad positioning. Um, and then I'm sure that a lot of product people are listening to you right now, getting excited, thinking, oh my God. I need to bring this to my CEO, right? Or like we need to reposition mm -hmm. um, certain products. How can someone who doesn't really have all the decision-making power in the world can escalate that? So hopefully yeah. somebody else can can listen. Yeah. So I know a lot about this because this used to be this used to be the thing that I did all the time. So if we back it up, back when I was a VP marketing, so you would hire me as the vice president of marketing. I had product marketing underneath me. I'm the new vice president of marketing. I come in and I know a lot about positioning. And after a few weeks new on the job, you'd start to get this inkling like, you know what? I think the positioning here is bad. <laughs> and I can see it. And I can see it in the results of what's going on in marketing. And I'm hearing one story from sales and another one from product and another one from the CEO. And I'm like, oh yeah, the positioning here is not so great. And so there's two things I could do. If I'm a rookie, what do I do? If I'm a rookie, I go, I go walk into the CEO's office and say, your positioning's terrible. We should fix it. You know, and what's likely to happen there is the CEO is going to go, who the heck are you? You've been here for five minutes. Like, you don't know. Like, the problem is you. You don't understand it. You just need to understand it better. Um, and sometimes the CEO might be right. Maybe, maybe I don't understand it. Maybe there is something I don't get. It. Here's a better way to do it. Um, and this works every time because I've done it a bunch of times. So here's what you do. First thing you do is you go hang out with marketing or sales and you see if they see the same thing you see. So I used to always go and sit in, I'm brand new, right? So I have an excuse to do whatever I want. So I go over to sales and say, hey, I'm stupid. I'm brand new. I don't know anything. Um, I'm just here to listen in on some sales calls. So I would listen in on some sales calls and then I would start pointing stuff out. I'd say, mom, hey, did you hear on that last call where the customer said, hey, are you guys like Salesforce? And we're not anything like Salesforce. Like, that's bad. Why do you think customers compare us to Salesforce? It's not good. Did you notice that you got all the way through the pitch and right near the end, the guy, the guy thought we were this instead of this? Did you notice that? Hey, did you notice when you got to the, this part, that people were still asking questions about stuff you were doing at the very beginning. And if I asked this question enough, eventually I'd be having lunch with the CEO or the VP sales and say, you know, you ever notice that people compare us to a competitor that we don't compare to, or they don't really understand what we do. And, the, and generally the VP sales, if the positioning is weak, the VP sales knows this, they've seen this, right? So the VP sales say, yeah, it happens all the time. Like, I don't know what it is, but it's it's bad. You know, our marketing's bad. And I'll say, well, I got a theory. I think we got kind of weak positioning. I, have we ever looked at the positioning? Did we ever do a formal positioning exercise? No, is always the answer to that. <laughs> no, we haven't. And I say, hmm, all right. Well, let me, you know, let me do some thinking about that. And then I would go to product and I'd do the same thing. I'd be like, hey, I'm hanging out with sales. And I keep seeing there's this confusion between whether or not we're a CRM or whether or not we're an email. You ever see that out in the field, like when you're out and about? And like, what are we doing about that? And so it, same thing. Eventually, I'd be having lunch with the head of product, and I'd be like, I suspect that we got sort of loose positioning here, and we need to tighten it up. What do you think? Right. And so eventually I get the I get the head of product in. If, if sometimes I go do the same thing over in customer success because they're responsible for account expansion. So I go in, hey, when you're pitching, expand this in accounts. Like, don't you ever hear this? You ever notice this? And so now everybody's a little conscious of it. Then I go to the CEO and I say, look, I'm not saying the positioning is bad because I'm new here. I don't know nothing. But I, you know. Have we ever done a formal positioning exercise to validate the positioning we've got? Because I suspect, I'm not saying it's bad, but I suspect we can tighten it up. 
And I'll tell you, I hear something a little bit different from sales versus product versus marketing versus customer success. And the CEO generally, you know what the CEO always responds when you go in and have that call? They say, what's John and sales say? <laughs> That's always what they say. And they'll say, I don't know, man. We should call him. Let's, let's call him. Call him. So then we call him. And he's like, hey, John. Yeah. I got April, new marketing lady in my office here. And she's talking about this positioning thing. And what do you think? And, Guy in sales, well, I've just I've already worked him over. So, <laughs> so he says, he says, well, yeah, I've been thinking, you know, maybe we should look at this a good idea. And then he might make a couple more calls, and that's how I get him in. But I gotta work everybody else before I get to the CEO. And then the key is now I've got agreement. Let's come together and look at it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying let's just look at it. And it is what it is. Maybe we'll get exactly the positioning that we thought we had, but let's just validate it. So, all right, now I got the game together. But, but this is perilous. Now I got the game together. I can't just get them all together and say, okay, so let's just, you know, uh, why does everybody love our stuff and have this battle of opinions? If we get everybody together, we've got to work through a structured positioning exercise. If we don't, we're dead. So once it's step one, work the team. Step two, get the CEO on board. Step three, get the gang together. But then you got to make sure we got a process. Okay, here's how it's going to go. I'm going to facilitate. Here's the steps. We're going to walk through the steps and we're going to validate what we've got. And that's how you get it done, in my opinion. Love it. Um, this has been fantastic, April. I would love to continue chatting with you. And uh, unfortunately, we are up. But um, how can we learn more about your book and your working journal? Yeah, so I, so I wrote a book that kind of describes this positioning exercise like when I talk about bringing the gang together we got a methodology um, my book is is essentially my attempt at writing that process down like so if you wanted to do this yourself internally and get the gang together and do an exercise my book can give you a guide book for you know one way to, to do that um, the work I do as a consultant is I work directly with companies that want to do that process, but they want to have somebody from outside the company be the facilitator and ideally someone who's, you know, an expert on this stuff and has done it a couple hundred times. Um, so I do that. So my book is on Amazon. It's, you know, it costs like eight bucks or something. You can buy it there. And then otherwise my website is aprildunford.com. And you can, you can like follow me on Twitter. I don't really do anything on social media, but occasionally I'm on Twitter and I'm at April Dunford on Twitter. You can follow me there. Thank you so much. Take Thanks care. for having me. Thanks.